Welcome to this bonus episode of ITC Entertain the World podcast. In this episode, we'll look at four classic black and white episodes of The Saint. With 71 episodes to choose from, we had a daunting task. We narrowed this down to a provisional 15. These episodes were The Talented Husband, The King of the Beggars, Teresa, The Rough Diamonds, The Saint Plays with Fire, The Well-Meaning Mare, Luella, The High Fence, The Scorpion, The Miracle Tea Party, The Saint Steps In, Sibau, The Imprudent Politician, The Inescapable Word, and The Happy Suicide. These 15 episodes showcase a series at its very best. Many of the episodes we omitted were equally strong, but we had to draw a line somewhere. From the initial list of 15, we narrowed this down to four episodes. We begin with The Talented Husband. Talented Husband was obviously episode one. It was written by Jack Sanders and directed by Michael Truman. The episode starts with Simon Templer in the English theatre. We have to talk about this episode in particular because it's the, the starting point for the rest of the series. I like it for a number of reasons. I think the car is introduced in a wonderful way, as we've spoken on the main podcast. I think the saint looks absolutely impeccable in this. And this is introducing a new era for the 60s. This is like where the 60s really starts. I also think that Shirley Eaton is a wonderfully cast actress in this, plays the role wonderfully and her flirtation with Roger particularly in the bar scene where she's more flirtatious than the saint could be is a great piece of writing and directing and acting. I also like John Claren's Mrs Jafferty one scene in particular where he's come home from having been down the town and he's taken his makeup off and he's talking to his wife, but he's looking in the mirror. And I think he looks particularly sinister. For me, this is a wonderful pilot and a great starting point. Yeah, I mean, I'd almost go a step further and say it's not even a pilot, almost. Mm. We don't need any exposition. We know who Simon Templer is. And you watch that first episode and you feel that you've been watching it for years, which is one of the advantages, I suppose, of taking on you know a character who's already well known yeah i'm in agreement with you there rodney we just jumped straight into the action we're given the saints milieu immediately we're in that posh london theater he's at a black tie event we get no real backstory or whatever we don't need a backstory we just jump a very very bold step we just jump straight into the action and, and we accept it for what it is i love the fact that the play he's been to is appalling. And he <laughs> yes. says, I, he says <clears throat> to us at the very beginning, I don't know what you're looking for when you go to the theatre, so you might be looking for, and he sort of does Le Ponce type thing with his head, and then says, but I'm looking for fun, laughs and excitement. And it's almost like he's saying, that's what you're going to get with the saint. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, and I love his little mini Marlon Brando impression. In in terms of an action-adventure episode, it's a fairly static episode. It's a very talky episode. It's a a lot of dialogue-driven and whatever. But because of the production values, because of the space in the sets, you you can have that fluidity of the camera. Uh, And you you watch the opening scenes as there there are conversations going on between Maj and John Claren how Michael Truman moves his camera with his characters and it, and it, it just really makes an, what could have become an essentially stagey, stage-bound type episode 
it gives it it still starts us with that cinematic feel i think i would say as well there's a very small cast in this it's basically the same it's basically the clarens husband and wife and it's basically adrian halbred which is shirley eaton there are some smaller characters like the guy in the butcher shop who sells mrs jafferty the the, the steak she's going to put in the, mm-hmm. the lamb stew and stuff but basically this is four people and for those four people to hold that 50 minutes of attention is no mean feat mm. no, there is a theatrical side to it it's almost like a four-hand play mm-hmm. and as you say you've got other characters like the doctor or i think it's mario who runs the hotel who's his friend who come into it i love the fact that when the saint arrives and he arrives at that hotel and he says to mario i don't like being a cog in the machine and in a way that's the sort of the pilot element in that he's telling us i think very early on i'm not going to be told what to do yes it's philosophy rather than exposition isn't it from from yeah. the saint? It's, it's, it's a nice little scene that actually. It's it's very well, well done, and the plotting, particularly as you get towards the end, where um, John Claren is sort of expostulating all his various alibis, putting all his alibis together. The plotting is really nicely done too. Yeah, and also I'd like to point out the set there of the Clarence house for a, a first episode is brilliant because it's got a ground floor. It's got the upstairs, which you see them going up and down, but it's also got a basement as well. I don't know if you've noticed that. He opens the door to put some stuff that's going down into a basement. I mean, there was no expense spared on that first episode to say this is style, this is panache. Um, not only the sets and the car, but the actor and the actresses. This, this is an absolute top-notch quality production that you're going to watch now. Yeah, and it's a lovely expansive set. There are a couple of a couple of shots, I think, towards the end, done from the stairs, and you and you just get to see the the entire scope of the ground floor set, and it's absolutely, you can you can see with the budget we've got thirty thousand an episode or whatever, you can see the money on the screen. You've also got some almost delightfully, slightly old-fashioned locations. That railway station, mm. and it, it sounds silly, but I'm always shocked that it's like a steam train. And we forget that on the rural lines, they were still using steam trains yep. and that train station with, you know, everything from the person who punches your ticket. There is a wonderful sense of a vanished age in there. And that high street, which probably hasn't changed in 300 years. And of course, the saint nearly runs over Mrs. Jafferty right at the beginning yeah. of the yes. whole episode. Very, very it, nice could have been, it could have been over very early on. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, you mentioned the steam train, of course. This is pre-beaching acts, isn't it? So uh, every little town had a steam train or a train line. And like you say, I, th- I think that's a very important point. But uh, this is still, like we said, this is kind of really in effect 1950s England. The thing mm-hmm. that is the 60s, is the saint in his car and he's dragging the, the rest of it kicking and screaming into this new decade it's like the, there's still a foothold in the 50s and he's the one who's saying right come on it's a new decade we've got to get on with it i love the fact that this serial killer because that is basically what he is you know he's rotten at coming up with theatrical productions but he is a brilliant actor as yeah. in the character is a brilliant actor mm-hmm. and how often we get to see him changing putting on makeup taking off makeup again it it fits in with the whole idea of the saint having that sort of self-referential level and that scene you talked about jazz it's wonderfully creepy that mirror reveal of john claren as mrs jafferty chatting on what we can see but his wife can't see mm. yeah and I... I think at that moment he's saying something very loving to her isn't he yeah, yes. He's, yes, he is. And he looks hideous because he's halfway between <laughs> Mrs. Jafferty and the husband. But yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful point you've made there, um, Rodney. There's, a, there's a, 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 a striking irony that if John Claren, put, uh, John Claren plotted to kill his wife, if, if he'd put that down in the play, he would have had a hit because here we are all watching it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, and on that note, I think we should move on to our next episode in our little mini bonus podcast that we're doing here for you. 
So the next episode is The Saint Place With Fire, which was written by John Cruz and directed by Bob Baker. The reason we've chosen this one is because of its political content. It's a topic that's not gone away, but also it's a subject matter that was very close to Bob Baker's heart and Monty Berman's heart and Johnny Goodman's heart. And this is a really hard hitting, dark episode. The camera work and direction from Bob Baker, I think is stunning. There is a wonderful, wonderful shot where they are in the headquarters of the Nazi movement, BMP, whatever you want to call them, where he's shooting down and looking up at the leader of the BMP. But over his shoulder is a portrait of Adolf Hitler. And the way that is shot is almost like to say, this guy might be the leader, but in the background, he's got this guy whispering in his ear, almost like stuck on his shoulder, being the, you know, the bad influence all the time. I cannot speak highly enough of the direction in this episode. Well, one of the things I like about St. Plays with Fire is the script writer didn't have the problem that most of the script writers did on the show, which was taking a short story and having to extend it. Here you've got a full novel. And um, having read the novel and um, then uh, read um, John Cruz's script, he does brilliantly because, for example, in the novel, uh, the two journalists, we only meet dead. So you've not built up any sense of sympathy or empathy with at all. We see it in, in the episode, both of these guys committed at work, one of them undercover, risking his own life. And so when they're then both revealed as having been murdered, it adds a real depth that you simply don't get in Charteris's novel. It's very much a character-driven episode, but it holds such power. And Bob Baker builds us up, puts us down, builds us up again. And, and some of the tension he generates, I mean, and the, the use of music, that almost Wagnerian Teutonic theme when Kane Luker is, um, is speaking and he, and he lifts it in the soundtrack and, he, and you can feel the madness in the music and, it, and it's, it's very very effective it's really nicely done but I mean for, for me one of the major pieces is towards the end the tension when you think Lady Valerie is about to be shot it's almost palpable he, he builds it so well so strongly but in not cinematically normally you would come to a peak here and then you would get when we get the resolution of that situation the tension diminishes. But in this, I don't think it does. I, th I, think, I think it just, he brings it up to that pitch and that pitch stays for quite a while. That's quite an effective ending. A very strong cast as well in this. So you mentioned mm -hmm. there Lady Valerie, who is played by Justine Lord, but we also have Joseph First as Kane Luca, who's the head of the BMP, who's like the new Hitler, who's really sinister, has no problem in killing anyone who stands in his way, as we've seen it already with the death of the journalist. And he's prepared to murder Lady Valerie, who is basically one of his supporters. Obviously, he would like to get rid of Simon Templer. We also have Teal in there which, with Ivor Dean, Robert Brown playing Howard Jackman, who's the Saints sort of uh, newspaper ally who tips him off about things. Should mention as well, Margaretta Scott and Jeffrey Denton, who are backing the BMP, but without realising what really is going on. Lots of little undercurrents and well plotted out points in this. What makes the episode shocking isn't Joseph's first character. It's the fact that the upper classes are heavily involved with this. And the coroner, you've got a coroner who's meant to be like a judge and he's already been bought before the court scene even begins. And that court scene takes up a huge amount of the episode. It's a very theatrical yeah. court scene. And you probably don't see Simon Templer more angry at any point in The Saint than he is in that. Yeah. Where he basically says, you know, you've been bought. This whole thing is a joke. The guy's been murdered. All down the line, it's that sort of, I mean, the, the most frightening element is that un, unthinking acceptance of all of this, the unthinking, the sort of 
tug forelock of the coroner. These are my better, so I'll do it this way. <laughs> uh, and the upper class is just blindly following Kane Luca and not really thinking about it, thinking what it means in terms of humanity and, and death. And there's, there's a wonderful scene, it's literally only about 30 seconds, and it's not in the novel, where the, um, the newspaper editor, Jackman, says to uh, Simon Templar, he says, people who forget the past are sometimes condemned to relive it. And you can't get a much better line than that. that you know, that's a wonderful line that John Cruz puts in because the saint who in the teaser has suggested that he's angry about it, he's actually quite cavalier during the episode for a long time. He thinks, well, this can't happen in Britain. You know, not this soon after the Second World War. And suddenly that's a little reminder to him. If, if you don't stay on the ball, things can get very ugly. See, it's the old adage, evil flourishes when good men do nothing. You should point out that that um, scene at the start, the teaser, that was actually a, a real anti-Nazi rally that was taking part at the time. And Johnny Goodman, who's one of the show's production crew, was down there protesting. Real hard-hitting episode, in, obviously it's content, but you know it meant a lot to the people who worked on this show. As I've said in the, the earlier podcast, to have the daring to use the term the final solution so close to the end of the war, it, it must have been quite chilling to a lot of people to, to hear that coming out of the TV again. Well, as, as the saint says at the start of it, less than 20 years ago, we won the war against Nazi tyranny. And today, the spectre is emerging again. It's less than 20 years after the war. And here it is in, in, on the streets of Britain which, yep. you know, hundreds of thousands of men died for to stop it happening. And it's sadly just as topical as it ever was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We move on to our next episode in this short bonus podcast. This episode is called The Scorpion. This was written by Paul Erickson and directed by Roy Baker, the wonderful Roy Baker, who directed so many great episodes of The Saint, but also a number of other ITC shows and also The Avengers. I personally think this is one of the top three by a long way. I love the fact this is so dark, so gritty, so sort of dirty London. We're getting into that Gideon's Way territory that we all like and have spoken about before. It's just so well done. It's a wonderful story in the way that Yes, if you've seen it before, you can pretty much guess, I suppose, who the scorpion is. But if you haven't seen it, or you haven't seen it in a long time, and you've forgotten how the story goes, it's a wonderful, wonderful story about blackmail. And the supporting cast are really strong in this. Nairi Dawn Porter is brilliant. Sort of like the sort of high-class cool girl, in effect. Dudley Sutton as Eddie Black, her boyfriend who is being employed to bump off anyone who stands in the way of the Scorpion. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is about as good, I think, uh, as it gets. I love the fact that you've got this criminal chain from Harry, long Harry, Philip Latham, who mm. we see being hunted in that teaser all the way through, obviously, to the Scorpion himself. And um, there are still daring moments of sort of humor in there as well i mean we've got this sort of weird sort of nightclub haven't we bird nest or whatever it's bird's called. nest yes mm -hmm. yeah bird's nest because the guy who runs it is is birdie and uh, mm. as simon templer calls him and there are lots of little corny jokes that simon templer comes up with like i i suggest you start to sing or you'll end up in a cage birdie and all of these <laughs> and yet it, it is wonderfully chilling i mean i love the the set for the scorpion's house with this conservatory of glass cages and you've got everything from evil looking reptiles to the scorpions themselves and even eddie himself he's happy to bump people off but he's quite disturbed by the scorpions conservatory isn't he well he's mm -hmm. frightened of the scorpions isn't he he thinks yeah. i think he thinks he realizes one step out of line and he is going to get a scorpion down the back of his neck or whatever it's a, this is a brilliant episode. It's a very sort of film noir episode, and you've got some wonderfully strong characters and some, some, some brilliant scenes. I mean, when we've got 
Philip Latham as Long Harry explaining how he's seen the scorpion and he's likely to be murdered. There's a, that's a lovely piece of acting. Patsy Butler, Nairi Dawn, Dawn Porter, such a strong character in this, really, really good. Um, when she when she's first uh, trying to get the money out of Mark Everest at the nightclub, she drives the scene. She drives all of that. Brilliant performance, brilliant dialogue, and she has him on the hook and she makes him apologise for uh, insulting her. And then later on, when we go back to her flat, the actual scene setting, production value, set dressing, whatever, it just so encapsulates that the sort of near emptiness of life in a single room in London at that time. It, it's beautifully done. And she realises that her, there's the scene where, where Simon confronts her and she says, how I spend my money is my business. And how you make it, says Simon, is mine. And that scene really builds well. Roger Moore hardens up significantly. The tension comes up and comes up. And then it peaks wonderfully with a little sound effect of the kettle boiling. Marvellously mm. done. Well, I mean, Patsy Butler, when she's at a nightclub, it's almost like she's on the stage, isn't it? And she's acting. And when we see her back at her seedy bedsit, and we see the reality of the actress, as it were, that's wonderful. And there's a brilliant fight with a knife-wielding Eddie in the Bird's Nest Club. I think that's one of the great Simon Templar fights. I love Simon Templar going in disguise as both Harry and Eddie, um, you know, which he does brilliantly in it as well. I love that little touch when he's trying to get the information out of Thomas Baptiste as the barman. And Tom, they're, they're in there in the bar in the next morning cleaning up. And <laughs> Simon just nonchalantly walks up, taps, taps his foot on the vacuum cleaner to turn it off, gets the information. And as he's leaving, cheekily taps it back on and yeah. <laughs> the barman goes on mm. uh, doing his chores. Very yeah. funny, very nice touch. I like, I like the fact that uh, the Dudley Sutton, Eddie Black, he's a... Uh, it's very contemporary because he's like a, a a rocker type, you know. So we had the mods and rockers story in Gideon's Way, but here we've got got a rocker in this. But also a shout out for Catherine Woodville, who plays Karen Bates, because I think that she's good in this, but she's quite mod. So mm -hmm. whereas you've got Eddie, who's the rocker, you've got her with her sort of uh, Mary Quant haircut very mod girl yeah i like that I, I like the fact when they're touching in like contemporary fashions i, I love the way eddie sort of becomes a mini me of uh, the scorpion and when, he, when he's confronting patsy and threatening patsy he sort of gives it all that same spiel same speech yeah. uh, in, in a reduced version yeah much more simplistic version <laughs> uh, if you're talking about the episode you've got to mention the ending which is, which is one of the more unusual and striking endings of any of the black and white episodes, the way that the, the scorpion actually um, bows out of the scene. Very, very effective, very well done. Nice nice little touch from Jeffrey Bailden. Could be some spoilers coming up here, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> Which we won't say, Shay. Okay, should we move on to our very final Saint recommendation from ITC Entertain the World mm. podcast, black and white episodes. This episode is Sibau. Is it Sabao or Sabao? I, I don't know. I, I, I can't I remember from the episode. Sabao. But anyway, Sabao, yeah. I love this one. Written by Terry Nation and directed by the great Peter Yates. Mm -hmm. What a fantastic director. Set in Haiti. This is like a mini live and let die for me. We've got Jean Rowland, who is fantastic as Sabao herself. We've got John Carson, who is Net Lord, And he's he's great in this and i love the two hands as he has with roger and he's definitely up to no good trying to get the mysterious powers of voodoo from the guys called manon who's played by christopher carlos classic scene where the saint is dining with net lord and is surprised as his host explains his megalomaniac scenes he's, he's admitting to it that he could be more powerful with this voodoo john carson is one of those act few actors in the 60s who he's equally good as as victim or evil mastermind mm -hmm. he can do both i mean he actually even turns up doesn't he in the saint episode as a indian sort of um hippie sort of guy this is one of the best teasers of all time I absolutely love that teaser and the way we see 
the name revealed in the sort of grains of sand. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that always, it's ridiculous because I don't know how many times I've seen it, always surprises me is you expect the voodoo to sort of be explained away during the episode mm -hmm. that somehow it, it's all been faked by someone and it never is. And everyone has an open mind about it. I think the white doctor says to, to Simon Templer, when you see something which you know is impossible, leave room in your mind for doubt. And I love the fact that even by the end of the episode, the inference is that actually voodoo is some sort of powerful spiritual presence. Keep an open mind about it. There's a great deal of respect from the, the director and the whole production for, for this thing, which is essentially a religion still. I think it's one of the better one of the best episodes I, I love it i think it's really well done really well executed there are some smashing touches of direction this 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 is for me the equivalent of a classic 1943 1940s zombie movie um, the, the thought, sort of thing jacques tonneau was doing for val luton uh, in hollywood absolutely brilliant i mean the the build-up and death of jerry stovin's character is Classic horror movie stuff, the intercutting of the restless victim, the voodoo ceremony, the spooky music, the saint suddenly being disabled in the jeep, the body's gone, the unseen walker walking through the jungle to the flat. It, 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 it just reeks of classic horror movie. It, it's wonderful. And again, another brilliant sequence when the conclusion of the Net Lord dinner, when Roger's, uh, Roger's been drugged and you've got the harmless gun sequence. That, that is really effective, really quite spooky. And, and like I say, the biggest thing for me is the respect for the subject here, because mm -hmm. voodoo is, a, is still a faith to this day. Uh, and, and like Rodney said, nobody's trying to explain it away. There's no trickery. There's no evil mastermind behind it. It's all very well done. We get a bit of a backstory on Templar in that he's obviously got contacts in high places. He contacts the Pentagon and he's put straight through. Yep. So, you know, even though he's not part of the establishment, he sort of is in a way. And there are wonderful little touches, like you've got the test of the serpents and then a serpent suddenly become ropes, etc. Mm. Yeah, and um, uh, e even watching it with my 2020 used to all sorts of special effects. I think the special effects in this episode are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think the, the whole production design is quality. All, all of the sets are wonderful and, and everything. Before I forget, I was going to say there's a wonderful thing in the teaser when the guy disappears and Simon Templer has the joke. He says, that would be really useful if I could have that when a je jealous husband <laughs> appears and I could just <laughs> make him vanish. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah, is it the funniest thing there? Is he says of making the the husband vanish and not yes. himself? So, yes, which, yeah. which you think he's going to say? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, a shout out for one particular fine piece of Roger Moore's work in this episode. When they're all sitting on the balcony, you will you will note his his wonderful bit of mosquito acting as he's sitting <laughs> slapping slapping off the bugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But is it is it just me who was fooled first time watching that episode? I thought the, un, the under uh, what turns out to be the undercover agent was actually drunk. I just think he's a really annoying drunk who yes. Simon Templer wants to punch, and yes. uh, it's a real shock to me. I remember the first time I watched that, and then realised, oh, Jerry Stovin, yeah, he uh, he is a very annoying drunk, and you're quite right that if I was Templar, I would have wanted to punch his lights out to be honest yeah um, yeah he plays it very well yeah but gene yeah. roland is beautiful in that i mean both as actor and, and just physically i think she's stunning in that she has a real presence doesn't she mm. she's yeah. far, far far better in that than she was in a man in a suitcase episode yeah but what i was going to say is she's understated in her performance she's mm. really good but she's not like laying it on do you know what i mean yeah um, and and another sort of i mean Another mention for a, a wonderful little performance, Kevin Stoney as the Doctor. Mm. It, 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 yeah. it, 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 when he's doing that exposition of how he's been there however many years and he still feels like a stranger because he's not inducted into the faith and whatever. It's uh, really, really well played. The, the whole thing and has he's got not some your, quality acting. And he's not yeah. your sort of racist expat Doctor, is he? No, he's no. someone who actually has a genuine sort of respect for the local people, which again makes it refreshingly different from what you might expect. I swear yeah. he says this is the land of the undead, the living dead, if you like, the zombie. So he's 
not necessarily understanding it, but mm -hmm. is respecting it. Yeah. And, and I think we could probably say this is as good a overseas and in inverted commas episode as there is, couldn't we? Yeah. Yes. I, I wouldn't argue with that. And and the thing is, because of the subject matter, what if one player lets it down, the whole thing can go. But everybody plays it straight. Well, I hope we've given you a flavour very quickly there of some fabulous black and white episodes of The Saint to watch. We could go on. We could list at least another 15 between us, I'm sure. Um, but we had to narrow it down to four just because of the runtime of this podcast. But if you are in any doubt, please do give this show a chance and watch these four and then when you get the opportunity to watch some more because the black and white saint series is by far probably the best itc black and white series by a long way anything you guys like to add before we sign off i think that was perfect um one one small snippet i'd like to just put on um i see lou was doubling his money in the talented husband and probably probably knocking off a royalty because when we see Madge upstairs watching the TV, she's actually watching an episode of another ATV show, The Larkins. Sitcom. <laughs> oh, trust you to get your trivia in there, Smudge. Love it. I've got to. I've got to. It's irresistible. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Right. Okay. On that note, we will say thank you again for listening. Please do send your comments through and your thoughts through on the ITC Entertain the World podcast which is hosted by me, Jazz Wiseman, with my great co-hosts, Rodney Marshall and Al Smudge, who without, I would not be able to do this. So thanks to you guys, and we'll see you very soon. You have been listening to episode 6B of the ITC Entertain the World podcast with myself, Jazz Wiseman, Rodney Marshall and Al Smudge. It was a bitter and twisted limited production for the morning after.